Early on, I would say when we were doing maybe just three, four million in sales, I thought to myself, well, this company isn't going to grow much anymore. Again, I looked at what was happening on Amazon. There was regulations coming down. New rules were changing. And I kind of felt like, ah, I don't think this is going to work. I thought maybe we should sell the company. And what really, what really changed my mind was Meruth Thinking Unlimited, but also being around my peers who opened my eyes to what they were doing and the success they were having on different channels. But when you spend time with successful people, people who, who, who are stronger than you, greater than you, smarter than you, it helps transform your limitations. Despite the business and the successes and all these great things, none of them really will fulfill that deep lack inside. Double down on your internal work. The rest will manifest. The worst thing a person could do is just focus on being successful and not looking into their fears. Hire a coach. Get a Kabbalah teacher. Get a therapist. Get people around you who can help you work on you. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to episode number 13 of the Success Series. I'm your host, David Berg. I'm here with our co-host, Michael Kamnowski. Our guest of honor today is David Guillaume. David has been a Kabbalah teacher for the last two decades and also is the president and co-founder of Mary Ruth Organics, the fastest growing vitamin company in the nation and the fastest growing on Amazon as well. You can find their product in any Whole Foods or major market across the country. David, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on the show today. You've been a mentor to me from an early age and provide continuous guidance, and we'd love to hear a bit more about your story. Thank you so much for having me. Where, where would you like me to start? How did you get to where you are today? Where are you from? What did your childhood look like? Okay, so I would say from an early age, probably the age of 15, I started to, um, I, w- I was a high achiever in school and I, and I was looking for ways to make money. I got into the stock market through investing. It was also the dot-com boom, so everybody was making money, and uh, it was working out very well. I remember being in my high school and just checking out of class and going into the library and having computers set up and and kind of day trading from then. Mm -hmm. Back then, it was a a dial-up. We didn't really have uh, internet the way we have it today. And then there was success there. My uncle said, well... Uh, I think he got a little worried about the way my life was going. And he said, you should, you should study Kabbalah. It's a spiritual path. I thought it was religion. So I said, no. And I was, I was kind of against like a dogmatic approach to life. And he said, no, it's spirituality. So I said, I'll try it. I came to my first class and changed my life. And I realized that you're learning the universal laws of life. So as a, as a teenager, wanting to be successful, wanting to be powerful, wanting to be kind of um, going on a faster pace in my life than I saw my peers going through, I thought Kabbalah was perfect. So I I dove in deep. It was so transformative and powerful that I decided to speed through college. I graduated from UCLA early. I I was 19 years old when I graduated. So I kind of finished four years in about a year and a half. And I decided to join the Kabbalah Center full-time as a volunteer to teach one-on-one here in Los Angeles and teach seminars all around the world. Probably given 2,000 seminars in in live settings, probably done about 30,000 hours of personal one-on-one coaching. And it it has been the most transformational and fulfilling part of my life. When I was 29 years old, got married, I realized just living a nonprofit life wasn't going to provide the life I needed to raise a family. Mm -hmm. I also realized that... Um, I spent the last decade through the wisdom of Kabbalah helping other people become successful. So uh, May Ruth and I started a brand when we were probably 30 years old, and it's called Mary Ruth Organics. And so we started off selling liquid vitamins on Amazon, like better for you liquid vitamins, because the whole world is pretty much hooked on capsules and pills. Sure. I think about 80% of the wealth in this market is pills. And I, I, we kind of saw that there was going to be pill fatigue and people wanted a more highly absorbable format to vitamins. So we 
created a liquid vitamin. Then we came out with gummies. We're probably number one in liquids nationwide. We're number one on Amazon, and we're in stores all over the U.S. now. So ten years, fast forward in ten years, we yep. have about close to two hundred employees. Um, and now I, probably, I pretty much split my time 50-50. The fulfilling aspect is definitely teaching Kabbalah and helping people. And then the other aspect is helping to run the business and growing it. So going back to your early childhood, what were your desires as an 18, 20-year-old before stepping into Kabbalah? I, I, I just wanted to be successful. I, I kind of had a, a goal of working really hard, getting good grades, going to an Ivy League school and going to business school and then making a lot of money. That was the trajectory I laid out for myself. I, I scored really well in testing. I did well in school, but I was also kind of a troublemaker. So um, the fact that I found spirituality and Kabbalah, what it did is it gave me a system of how to live life, a system of how to be successful with other side effects, uh, a system of not making it about myself, but making, creating win-wins and making about others. And I think that's also what helped me be successful early on. So like, for example, early on when we started the business, I joined a, a mastermind group of other online sellers. There was about 200 of us. And what Kabbalah always taught me is add more value than you take. That's where success mm-hmm. is. Every time you're adding value more than you're taking, People want to be around you more. People want to give back to you. People will share uh, with you their their successes and how they got there. And they generally root for you. They pray for you. And that's what we need. If you have people who are against you and people who feel that they're not getting value from you, you're kind of isolated. You're exiled from sure. success. I'm not saying that if it's not in your destiny, you won't be successful. But I've learned any environment I go into, I try to solve everyone else's problem before I try to solve my own. And Kabbalah taught me that. Your father taught me that. Kabbalah Center, the culture of that is how do we add value to other people's lives? Sure. So then what happened was I joined this group and I literally just started posting my best content for the group, what's been working for me, and offering my services and help to other people because I had the spiritual background and having (laughs) taught Kabbalah to a lot of wealthy, successful people learning vicariously through their lives, what their mistakes were, what their lessons were. I had a I had a lot I could share. So I offered that and I just kind of gave unconditionally uh, without looking for a return. I always kind of use this expression to invoice the creator. Like mm-hmm. I, I like to give people and then go to the creator and say, well, you now have to replenish me sure. if you want me to give to your world. And it's this consciousness that helps you remove the agenda that, that uh, behind giving. Because I think if you give with an agenda, people feel it and it's not as magical. So that's it. And sure. I shared that with the group. And it's amazing because whenever I needed something <clears throat> or I needed uh, to solve a problem, and instead of having to go through the pain and suffering of figuring it out, I had 200 CEOs who were willing to always be there for me and help me. Sure. And going back to your family life, was your family a proponent of pushing you to teach Kabbalah and go face first into it? Or were there, was there sort of a... Initially, a my family liked that I studied Kabbalah because they saw that I needed some kind of spiritual framework. And so they were very excited to see that I became like a, a very disciplined person. I started to live by spiritual laws. I started to overcome my own reactive nature. I started to overcome gradually insecurities, fears, need for approval, all of which in your teenage years are the most toxic. Sure. So when Kabbalah helped me literally tap him to my superpowers and slowly transform a lot of negativity. This was my family's dream. I mean, it was my parents' dream. I think what what they didn't, what they weren't so fond of was that I decided not to enter the business world and enter the nonprofit world, uh, essentially helping people and not making money for myself. I think that's worrisome to, to especially a Persian uh, family here in Los Angeles. But I said, look, this is what I believe in. I know that one day I will be successful as well, but that's not my goal right now. My goal is now to develop myself and help other people. And it was uh, it was probably, I wouldn't say probably, it was the right decision. So you always had that certainty that you would be successful financially no matter what. I always knew that I would have the life that I've always wanted. I didn't know how it was going to come about. And even as a Kabbalah teacher, I got to travel to you know, every city in the United States multiple times. And when I went on tour to teach Kabbalah, I was in three to four different cities a week, 
teaching crowds of two to 500 people each night, staying at different hotels, eating at great restaurants, being with great people. So it was kind of like a, I hate to use the word, it was almost like a rock star <laughs> type situation where you you got to experience as if you were, um, as, if I, as if I was wealthy, even though I didn't have one dollar to my name. Right. It's interesting because when you are connected to what we call the light of the creator or you're doing the work of, of helping other people and transforming their lives, the universe brings to you whatever you need uh, to live the best life to do so. As long as, I'll, I'll footnote this, as long as you, you, you don't have a limited belief system about what you should be receiving. So I'll segue just to a spiritual sure. concept. A lot of people are helping, giving, sharing, and sacrificing themselves and creating great value for others. But the reason why they don't receive the miracles, they don't receive the wealth, they don't receive the power and fulfillment they're looking for is because they don't believe they deserve it. So there's some kind of negativity that's in their consciousness that even though the creator and the universe is ready to give them, what they're looking for. If, because they are limited in what they believe they deserve to receive, they're subconsciously rejecting it. Mm. They don't know they're doing so. But I would say that as long as you do believe that you are destined for greatness and you deserve greatness and you aren't ashamed of it and you don't have limited belief systems around it, you will receive it if you do the spiritual work. You touched previously on insecurities as a younger adult, as every 18 to 20 year old experiences to one way or another. Yeah. Were you atypical or did you have those same insecurities growing up and in, in into your- Oh, the most, adulthood? the most. Really? Always, always felt rejected growing up, always felt like you know, going from school to school, never really fitting in. Um, and you, you always, I think growing up, always kind of like looking for approval. Mm. And Kabbalah really helped me realize that that was an endless pit of never getting what you want. If you're constantly looking for people's approval, even if you get it, you're just gonna want more of it. If you don't get it, you're gonna feel insecure. And it's exhausting and draining to have to live your life based on other people. So I think I learned early on that I have to do, and again, to learn this as a teenager, as a 17 year old, as an 18 year old, I made the decision, I have to make decisions that are right for me and follow the spiritual laws. Not what my parents want, not what my family wants, not even what my friends are expecting or even what my teachers are expecting of me. And that was really powerful. I think most people don't learn that lesson until many, many decades later, if even at all. And so I was able to carry those lessons to teaching CEOs and teaching celebrities and, and, and people who are very high profile who have a lot of power and wealth and influence, but also have very deep insecurities and you know, someone with 20 million followers could get thousands of comments saying we love you. But then when there's one comment that says, I, you know, I think you're you're this and you're that, and I hate you and you're ugly, and it, it could depress you the whole day. Right. So I was I was speaking to this one um, this one person who is massive following. His name is Adam. He's uh, got probably eight million followers. He's he's that's about a billion views a month. It's one of the largest wow. short form comedic uh, content producers in the world. And I always like to ask people like what you do. I like to ask them what makes them successful. Sure. So he says he's considered one of the funniest people in the world right now. But when people tell him he's funny, he doesn't believe them or listen to them because he said to me, I don't want to believe them when they tell me I'm funny because I also don't want to believe them when they tell me I'm not. And so he's just working every day to produce the best content, the best value, and bring that to the world. How does he gauge his level of success then if not for the audience? That's a good question. So he's deep into analytics and he is deep into understanding what the audience wants or doesn't want. But that's only so that he can improve and give more value, mm -hmm. not allowing that to determine who he is as a human being. Sure. So yes, you should ask everybody their opinion and you should listen to what everybody says in order to improve your product. But your product is not you. Even if you are the talent, you have to realize it's not your essence that, that, that they are defining. It is the energy that is being emitted from your essence. And so that we should always be improving. You're emotionally detached from it. You're, you're emotionally detached from it and you're not, you're, you're not letting that person define if you're great or not, if you're if you're good or not, if you're powerful or not, 
Because at the end of the day, you have to, whatever you determine about yourself is what people will feel. And if the whole world tells you you're a piece of crap, but you tell yourself you're not, eventually 8 billion people will be influenced by you as long as you're not influenced by them. Right. We see the final product of your successes today. What are some of the biggest challenges you faced, whether early on or throughout the journey of, of getting to where you are today? I think before every great leap into maybe a new higher revenue, better products, uh, great employees, like whatever success was about to come, it was always preceded by something very dark and painful and confusing. And again, I, I share this with our employees and our team, and it's a lesson that I've learned in Kabbalah, which is knowing this, knowing that before great revelation of energy, let's say, for example, you want to double your revenue this year, which is not an easy thing to do in this environment. But if you want to achieve that, you have to know that there will be illusionary and painful challenges that come. It will make it look like you're going the exact opposite direction. They'll look like not only are you not doubling your revenue, you're probably going to have less revenue than the year before. Kabbalah has taught me this is a complete illusion and it is a test. And all that matters is your consciousness. I was talking right before the podcast, talking to another founder, an incredible business, almost $100 million a year um, selling in fashion. I'm sure, uh, I don't know if I should say his name, but yeah. you're definitely familiar with the brand. And you know, he told me, you know, fashion is down and people aren't spending as much, whatever. But what we, why, why we talk to each other is because we inspire each other. But we realized it doesn't matter if people aren't spending. It doesn't matter if fashion is down. It doesn't matter if there's war in the world. All that matters as a founder is your consciousness and your determination to be successful. Because there are 8 billion people, there are people who are spending, and it's the creator who determines uh, your success, not other people, mm. not the economy, not inflation, not pricing. So having been in this situation before where the company wasn't doing as well, and I started to feel dejected because I saw that the economy was slowing down, I realized, wait, I'm not the effect of the economy. I, I use Kabbalistic tools. One of them we teach in Kabbalah One is like, the technology of praying. I think religion is, has, has not a good job around teaching what true prayer is. But prayer is a, is a request out to the universe coming from your soul that builds a vessel for miracles. It's not Prayer is not convincing a man in the sky to, to, to do you a favor. Prayer is a technology that creates vessels to hold energy. So what I would literally do is I would spend hours walking in the streets, talking out loud to the universe, saying, reveal to me the idea, the product, the innovation, the marketing, the, the wherewithal to go totally against what the economy is doing, right? What is the next $100 million product? And I would pray for this. Right. And literally that's what happened this year. Like something was revealed to us um, and then the right people came to us. And, and, and as a result, we grew more this year than any year prior, wow. which is hard to do when you've when you're at a high revenue. You don't grow that much once you pass like a nine figure revenue mark. Sure. But what I realize is, even if consumer spending is down, inflation is up, pricing is wonky, people don't have money. That doesn't matter. What matters is your consciousness, your ability to create a great product that is good for the consumer, and your certainty that you will deliver that. Were there moments throughout building this business that you thought it wasn't going to work out? And if so, how were you able to push through that? Yeah, early on, I would say when we were doing maybe just three, four million in sales, I thought to myself, well, this company isn't going to grow much anymore. Again, I looked at what was happening on Amazon. There was regulations coming down. New rules were changing. And I kind of felt like, ah, I don't think this is going to work. I thought maybe we should sell the company. And what really, what really changed my mind was Mary Ruth Thinking Unlimited, but also being around my peers who opened my eyes to what they were doing and the success they were having on different channels. And I realized, once again, limited belief system. I don't see the whole picture, and so I'm making decisions based on a limited picture. But when you spend time with successful people, people who, who, who are stronger than you, greater than you, smarter than you, it helps transform your limitations around what's possible. And so listening to Mary Ruth, listening to other people, seeing what success is possible, you know, we, we decided to... Uh, 
to keep growing, to keep scaling, even though we were doing it into the unknown. Wow. An- another spiritual lesson. Right. Mm-hmm. With every founder, there's strengths and weaknesses. What do you feel are your strengths? And then where do you delegate and, and don't feel the strongest in? I would say my strength is solving problems, growing and scaling. So I feel that despite not having any formal background in in, in, in education and building a business, being a CEO, being a growth marketer, like not having a finance background, like I literally am probably the least educated person Mm -hmm. in, in the rooms that I go into. But I have the belief system that anything can be grown and scaled to infinity if the foundation is right and the product is valuable. So what I like to do is my superpower, I believe, is networking, talking to other people, finding out what's working, what's not working, coalescing that energy of those ideas, not copying them. Because if you copy someone and you follow them, the energy's off. You're going to miss it. But I try to grab people's energy, feel them through osmosis, and then that helps craft a vision of how to grow and scale something. So once I find something that is a great product, I I see the path of how to grow it. And I would say the other thing that, um, for me, it's just all about manifesting. What's the bottom line? We can all talk here about ideas all day long. Sure. This is great, that's great. Everyone's got a great idea. But very few people actually push it into the end zone. And for me, it's about winning every day, pushing the end zone, manifesting. Stop talking about it. Like, I, I talked about this in my prosperity. I, had, I gave a course on prosperity and I, I talked about the spiritual concepts, capitalistic spiritual concepts we use to build a brand. And one of them was that in, I have to manifest 80% of any idea I have within 24 hours. If you take longer than 24 hours, the energy is diffused, the negative side comes in, it's not going to be successful. So if I have an idea for something successful, I will then spend the rest of the day in a silo trying to manifest at least 80% of it to create momentum. So I think that's my superpower. Where I'm very weak, I would say, is I don't like getting into the details of stuff. Um, I don't like necessarily managing too many people, like the administrative work. This is not for me. And I've learned to find great people that I can delegate that to, that it is their superpower so that I can stay more high level and strategic. Sure. How do you have that trust in people that you hire to do what you formerly had to do? So I always start with another Kabbalistic concept is I pray for it. I, I, I literally talk to the universe and I say, find me the right soul. I'm very, I'm very uh, detail-oriented about what I ask for. You know, like I ask for someone who is hardworking, someone who has a good heart, someone who's trustworthy, someone who's humble, someone who's not, uh, who, not opportunistic and jumping from thing to thing. And I've told you this before. I look at their resume on LinkedIn or, or whatever, and I see that if they've been at a different job every year, you know this person's not focused and you know they're either opportunistic or they can't handle the heat. Sure. And so they jump from one thing to another. But someone who's been somewhere for a good four years, it means that they're dedicated. I also am really big on testing people out, right? There's gotta be a dating phase. Rarely will I hire somebody full-time right away. Rarely, maybe 10% of the time uh, if I have no choice. But most times I bring people in as consultants Three month contract, they're testing us, we're testing them. If it doesn't work out, clean break. No hard feelings. Well, no hard feelings. When you hire someone, you know, they make lifestyle choices and decisions thinking they're going to be there long term. Uh, labor laws make it hard to necessarily let go of people like right away. Not that it's impossible, but I like to test everything and be very transparent and communicative about it from the get go. Sure. Most of our audience, younger demographic, 18 to 20 year olds suffering with anxiety, depression, don't know what they want to do with their life. What are some things that you did that you'd be telling them to start doing right away? Anxiety comes from not manifesting. And everyone's all about what's my passion, what's my passion. I think that is incredibly misleading. People should not be looking for their passion. Their passion will find them. What you need to do, Kabbalah explains it, is you need to create momentum around energy. You have to manifest. Even if it's stuff that you don't don't love, like complete, complete projects, finish them. Be the best at something. Develop the skill set of being the best at something. Make it less about what you're working on. Make it more about developing yourself to be the best at it because you can take those skill sets into everything. So for example, if you're in sales, 
even if you don't like the, I'm not saying this is true, but sure. let's say you don't like the product that you're selling or you don't like the company. So what? Become the best salesperson in the company. Fine tune your sales skills. Learn how to talk to people. Learn how to public speak. Learn how to communicate. Learn what is a good product. Learn what is a bad product. Learn how pricing works. Learn the art of inspiring people. Become the best at it. And when you feel that you, there is no more room to grow, that you've literally accomplished as much as you can, then you can move forward and you know find something else. Sure. Simultaneous to all that, I would pray to the universe and pray to the creator and say, hey, look, you bring me what is meant for my soul, but until then, I will take whatever is in front of me and manifest it and be the best at it. So I think if I was going back to being 18 or 20 again, I, you know, when I found Kabbalah, I said, all right, you know what? I'm going to be the best at this. I'm going to, if it's teaching, I'm going to be the best at teaching. And I remember taking public speaking courses because I want to be the best. I'm not just here to like teach. If I'm going to teach, I have to learn the skill set of how to teach. I hired a coach. I hired somebody to train me in public speaking. I hired two people, in fact. And these people, every day, they would force me to sit in front of a camera, give a seminar. They would record me. They would force me to watch it with sound on, with sound off, so that I can see how, how crazy I look when moving my hands around and what my body language is. But the point was, and it was uncomfortable. It was very uncomfortable. Really, it was? It wasn't uncomfortable. It, didn't it was annoying. To you? It was monotonous. You know, when your dad told me to go on tour to teach the intro to Kabbalah, I was so excited. I'm like, this is cool. I'm a rock star. Let's go. I was 23 years old. After the 30th seminar, remember, three to four seminars a week, right? So I'd be in Phoenix one day, Austin the next day, you know, Louisiana the next day, Florida the next day. And I'm like, this is cool. This is cool. This is cool. Different hotel rooms, different food, different pillows have to sleep on every night. I think by the 30th seminar, and I had about 170 to go. Wow. I called your dad and said, I'm burned out. I'm tired. This is boring. I'm teaching the same thing, and uh, I'm gonna come home. Wow. So he, then he said to me, "Now is the moment you're actually revealing miracles. Mm. Now it's not about you anymore. Now it's really about creating something new. Before you thought you were a rock star and you were enjoying it and having a great time, which is fine, but it, but it was more about you. Now that you don't really want to do it, but you know you need to. Now is when you're growing. So." That's that point that I think a lot of people give up, and that's what causes anxiety. If I had given up and I just went for the next shiny object, anxiety. Anxiety comes from when you're not pushing past your comfort zone. Uh, do, do people finish marathons, have anxiety? Like after they finish the marathon, you have anxiety? You feel proud, you feel accomplished, your body could be decimated, your feet are bleeding. Uh, one person said they had blood coming out of their nose and their wow. ears. But there's one thing they're not feeling. They're not feeling anxious. Anxiety. They're not. Anxiety comes from when you're stopping short and not completing stuff. So if somebody's experiencing anxiety and they're bedridden and they're in their house, you just say, go do. Go do. Go do. Go do. No matter Finish what things, it is. Complete things. Just whatever, whatever, whatever is needed by you at that moment, complete them, then create new, find new tasks. Whether you enjoy it or not, doesn't really matter. Spirituality is obviously a key component in your life. Do you believe one can be happy without spirituality or successful? I believe that if you do not study Kabbalah or have any spiritual path, I believe you can still make a lot of money. I believe you will still get married. I believe you will still have great kids. I believe you can live the same exact life as someone with spirituality. Wow. What's the difference? The difference is if you're in a dark room and I'm asking you to go find 10 objects in the room and bring them to me, I think eventually you'll find those 10 objects. And uh, you may hit your knee on a table. You may stub your toe. You may uh, take a really long time. You may not have full certainty in what objects you're touching or what you're grabbing. You may have to like grab the object, come out of the dark room, see if it's the right one, go back, put it back. Uh, but I think after maybe 10 hours, you'll find those 10 objects in the dark. You may have some bruises on you. And um, you will, may have felt like you spent a lot of time and you'd be exhausted, sure. but you'll get there. All Kabbalah is, or any spiritual path that is that is reputable, but Kabbalah, you know, I've found to be the most powerful thing, especially talking to hundreds of thousands of people who have taken spiritual paths and Kabbalah. Kabbalah is one thing. And your grandfather taught me this. You walk into the room. Why, why suffer? Why look for 10 objects in the dark? Just turn on the light. Turn on the light. Right away, you see the whole landscape. You see exactly where the 10 objects are. You can determine the most efficient way to grab all of them. 
you can avoid the the landmines and the tables and the stuff in the way. And that's it. Then you bring it back. You can bring it back probably in 15 minutes. Why do you need to go 10 hours with bruises, anxiety, and chaos? So that's that's what Kabbalah does is it shows you the whole playing field. When people come to Kabbalah 1, it takes about three weeks for them, for their eyes to open, and they see the whole playing field. Now, is it easy? No, now at least you see. Still got to go grab the objects. You still got to move your feet and do the work. But when you see the whole playing field, it's enjoyable now. Right. You're not grasping in the dark. Another thing we're often asked is, you know, you have a very full life. Professionally, spiritually, how do you balance the two? What is your what does your day-to-day split look like in your routine? I always use the word moment. When your person has momentum, the, the universe gives them like 100 extra hours a day. When you're slow and you're overthinking and you are not manifesting micro manifestations, you actually only have three hours in a day. It's very interesting. So as long as you have momentum, you have 100 hours in a day. If you have no momentum, you have three hours in a day. It's not 24 hours. So I will, uh, and Mary Ruth has always talked about this too. She's really big into um, like, Elon Musk calls it like time boxing mm. or uh, time blocking. Essentially, she plans out every 15 minutes of her day, the day before. I less so, but I kind of plan out the major themes of my life in my calendar. So if I'm up at 5.30, like I'm up, I'm going to the gym. I'm not overthinking it. I'm going to the gym. In the gym, I'm listening to something that is going to help elevate my consciousness, probably some kind of a spiritual podcast. Then I'm heading on to do more meditation and prayer. Like that's what I need. And I'm visualizing what my day is going to look like. I'm asking, I'm, I'm talking out loud and saying, who am I? What am I? Am I strong? Am I weak? And I'm transforming everything to be positive. I am strong. I am certain. I am powerful. I am abundant. I already have everything. I don't need anything. All I want is the light of the creator. I have certainty in myself. The creator has certainty in me. Whatever. These are all the things I will tell myself as early in the morning as possible. Otherwise, you are walking out there and you're going to get snipered. Like You will get hit. You will have to deal with chaos. But if your consciousness is strong from the get-go, you have momentum and you can carry that the whole day. Doesn't happen all the time. Sometimes I get sidetracked. Sometimes I have a bad night's sleep. This happens, that happens, and I see the effects of that. So I will, I will, I will do that. I will then ask myself every week, what am I doing that's taking me one hour that I can do in one minute? So anything that's taking me one hour, I should eventually be able to do in one minute. Does that mean I need to delegate it? Does that mean I need to create more processes? Are there things I'm doing that someone else could do for $25 an hour Mm. where maybe my time is worth $2,000 an hour? Why am I doing this thing, right? That's really a question we should all ask. Why why are you doing this if you can find someone to do it for you who would love to do it and make money and you can help the economy that way? Right. So I think... A lot of why people feel overwhelmed is they're not delegating. They're holding on. They're controlling. And that's part of their spiritual work. It's because they have trauma around letting go. They don't trust people. Past life, something happened to them that hurt them. So they feel like they need to be in control. But you're not going to grow and scale that way. I know people who are your age, single, no kids, and they feel more overwhelmed than I do with four kids, a business, and all that. Sure. So it really just comes down to Managing your time appropriately, not controlling and delegating when necessary. A lot of people see your life and a lot of people want to emulate it. What is an area or thing in your life that you yet have to manifest but still desire? Uh, Well, I don't think I've ever answered this question, but I'll tell you that despite the business and the successes and all these great things, none of them really will fulfill that deep lack inside. I'm not saying you should chase, shouldn't chase it. Like, you know, I know that you and people who are listening to this, they all have a goal to achieve a certain level of wealth, a certain level of prosperity, a certain level of relationship, children, whatever. When you get there, and you will, you are going to feel exactly how you feel right now. Okay? And probably even worse, you will feel a little sad, a little depressed because you no longer have the, the, the dopamine of I'm about to get it. An addiction specialist once told me, addiction isn't the person who's 
playing craps in Vegas and spending all his money, they're not enjoying the craps. What they're enjoying is the drive to Vegas. The I'm about to do something is a greater high than doing it. So as you're chasing success, you're, you're enjoying that more than when you get it. Because when you get it, you're going to realize this is not the solution. Something external cannot be the solution, something internal. So what I'm realizing, I'm 39 now, and I'm realizing now more than ever is that I got, despite having 24 years experience in the spiritual work, I'm now experiencing more than ever, like there's work I need to do on myself that maybe I have used outside success as a way to fulfill. And that's not a bad thing, but it's, it's, it's a, and maybe I had no choice until now. Sure. Because sometimes you need to have success to, to really do spiritual work, which I think is an interesting concept. Some of our spiritual work will only, like the biggest fears will come up after you're a millionaire, not wow. before. Yeah. You'll see. There's more fear of having money and losing it than not having it and having to make it. Really? Yes. The same way there's more fear in when you have kids, you have more fears than if you, don't have kids because you have something to lose now. Right. So you will see that your greatest challenges will come up when you have a relationship, when you have children, and when you have money. You will. I know people worth hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars who every moment have anxiety thinking they're about to go broke. Sure. And I know people who have five thousand dollars who are very content and they feel like they're they're very abundant. <clears throat> so what's the difference? What's going on in the inside? Right. So if anyone who is your age, my age, listening to this, double down on your internal work. The rest will manifest. And, and do it in parallel. Do it in parallel to becoming successful. But the worst thing a person could do is just focus on being successful and not looking into their fears. Hire a coach. Get a Kabbalah teacher. Get a therapist. Get people around you who can help you work on you. Make that more important than the wealth, then you'll have a great foundation to not just create wealth, but to hold it with happiness later on. What is something you don't yet have clarity on in your life that you'd love to? I would say I don't yet have clarity on my life. Something that I am asking the creator every day is, like, what do you want me to do now? Do you want me to grow the business? Do you want me to grow the Kabbalah side of things? Do you want me to grow my social channel? Do you want me to bring content to the masses or do you want me to just focus on a group of 10 amazing souls, 100 amazing souls, 1,000 amazing souls? I pray for this every day to gain the clarity. And and I, I what's exciting about it is even though I don't have clarity on that yet, the action of praying for it and wanting it is the spiritual work. Mm-hmm. So it, it, it's it's it's... it's this is another concept. You will always have an area of your life you don't have clarity on. It will always be that way because it forces you consciously or unconsciously to, to reach out to the creator. If every part of your life there was clarity, I promise you, you're not looking for God, you're not looking for spirituality, you're not looking for a system, you have, you'll be so arrogant right. and have so much ego, it's going to be disgusting. So there's always going to be one area that's like, it's not working. Sure. That's by design to help you grow. Do you feel ego still comes up in your life today? More so than ever before. Wow. How yeah. does it manifest? So much easier when I had nothing. Really? So much easier when you're just behind the scenes, prosper in silence, don't be a public figure. Like now, because as soon as somebody, we're all affected by approval. Somebody sa- As soon as somebody says, amazing. As soon as somebody says, you look good. As soon as somebody says, that helped me. Or, wow, I, I, it, it affects you. Sure. And then when it affects you and you don't catch it, you then think you're better than other people. And then you become short with people. Then you become controlling. And then you become, uh, then you're thinking to yourself, well, you should listen to me. Why aren't you listening to me? Like, all of that you need to really catch. I, I've seen people who I've seen do this well. I've seen your father do it really well, despite being a spiritual leader. Somebody cuts him off. He just, he stops and he's quiet and he listens. Right. And he's not annoyed by it. And I think that, having success you start to think you know better than everybody and it's, it's and at the same time you you do know more because you got to where you got, got to, to where for you got to. and at the right. same time you also not just know more but you, you you do need to value your time like i need to value my time more now than i did before like i need to say no nine out of ten times right but 
that also c- can come off as arrogant. So there's a lot more you have to deal with. Sure. We see you as a public figure. Everybody knows so much about you. We ask all our guests this towards the end of, of the episodes. What is something about David Guillaume that the world doesn't know? And there's something about me that the world doesn't know. I would say that I'm a very private, despite being a public person, I'm a very private person. And I'm a very sensitive person. And um, I think that I would say I'm very emotional. You know, as a, as a Pisces, I have a lot of emotions and feelings and I feel so much that it's almost overwhelming and too much. So to kind of combat that, I, I have to kind of be strong on the outside and I have to, I have to kind of um, have more of a dominant energy. But part of it is because when I, when I do get too close to people or, and I feel them, it, it's something that's all consuming for me. Mm. And so it can even disturb my life and my energy. I wouldn't say I'm an empath, but I think similar, similar qualities to that, I sure. think, is something that, uh, man, it's a really good question. Beautiful. Good question, yeah. The last thing I'd like to ask you, and to remove the personal aspect of it, for our younger audience who's aspiring to achieve success in any area of life, what are one or two things that they can start doing today to increase the trajectory of their life and, and help them live a more well-rounded uh, existence? Spend time Spend time with people who are inspiring to you, successful to you, serve them, follow them, shadow them, uh, don't annoy them, but ex- learn, learn, learn from great people. Do not waste your time on addictions. Do not waste your time on things that are not going to help you grow, but spend time with people who are inspiring. I think from the age of 16, I just identified the people who had good consciousness, good energy, were smart, were successful, and I literally followed them everywhere they went. I remember one person in the Kabbalah Center, I, he's, he's, the, he's a lead teacher. He would always go teach celebrities and teach founders and great CEOs. And I went to him and I said, uh, can I come with you to these classes? And he said, no, they're private. And I said, well, I want to come anyways. He said, no, you can't come. I said, well, I'm going to come. I'll, be, I'll stay in the car. Hmm. Uh, I'll carry your bag. Sure. And so then he's like, fine, come in the car. And in the car, there's a 20 minute drive and I'm talking to him and I'm learning from him and I'm watching what he does. And he gets on a phone call and he starts teaching someone. So I'm hearing it. I'm seeing how he responds, how he reacts. And through osmosis, it is totally conditioning me in a way that I would never get in school and academics and books, shadow successful people. And then eventually he let me into the, he didn't want me to stay in the car. He's like, all right, come in. And then eventually I'd come into those classes and they would get to know me. And eventually when he was sick, he would ask me to teach the classes. Wow. So what happens is you get your foot in the, you keep pushing. Don't, who cares what they say? At the end of the day, who cares what, if people push you away, but you really want to be close to them, say, I don't care that you push me away. I appreciate you so much. I'm going to follow you and shadow you and add value to you. I'll bring you a coffee. I'll find out what you need. I will solve problems for you. That's how you get to the top. Beautiful. David, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on. Thank you. Guys, thank you for tuning in. David, as mentioned, president, co-founder, and 20 years of spiritual wisdom and teachings. You can find him anywhere on his platform. His Instagram is at David Guillaume, and he's on every social platform. So David, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on. Thank you very much.